Good morning to everyone. My name is Luis Alcalá Galeano. I am from USC, Santiago de Compostela. And uh, I would want to introduce you two ideas related to the portrait, specifically during the 19th century. I know there is too much stuff, too much information on this slide, so let's get the paper worked on quickly and let's move on. Uh, it must be said that um, this research was hosted by the Departamento de Ciencias Humanistas de la Universidad de Gli di Catania, Italy. Well, I will want to focus on portraiture in our history, 19th century, and I like this small title about histories, stories, and journeys. Uh, we, uh, in Spain, we don't have this slight difference, this kind of difference between history and story, but English does, and I like this little difference. Personal preferences overall, of all that I have studied along my four years of history part here in Spain, what I have worked on a little more has been art and literature in the 19th century. I enjoyed the time spent with John Keats and his old Buna Grace and Earl, and also both Tennyson's and Waterhouse's Lady of Shallow Proposals, the pictorial one and the, and the poetical one. So, it is sometimes said that the most important decisions are made without thinking with the head, but through the heart. So here I am, researching about portraits. And going back to the point, uh, why 19th century? Well, I don't know. Uh, for me, 19th century uh, is a time of great change in such diverse aspects as economy, art, politics. And uh, as I said before, I am keen on the when I am keen on the relation between written and visual. So I select a quote from Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray directly related to this country. Every portrait painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist, not the model. In order to speak of the portrait, it is compulsory, we have to refer briefly to the image as a concept. So, once presented the topic, let's go with both the vision and the mission of this work. And after that, we will talk about how the portrait in the 19th century, in his two ways, both the pictorial and the photographical one, how this aims achieve the goal of representing the image of the people, of the society, of the artists, of everyone. But really, why is art important? This is one of the questions that many people who attend museums or galleries ask themselves on a daily basis. It is logical to think that art may not have a use, since it does not represent a basic activity of human survival. However, it's a sign that a certain culture is developing and that has, and this culture has the sensitivity to start creating cultural products. Cultural products are those manifestations that express the vision of our community. So their function, and that of art, is to meet the aesthetic and recreational needs of the human being. So why is art important? Why is it worth so much? Well, one possible answer, it is because historically it's been the visual witness of the evolution of the human being and his ideas. Um, in its beginnings, art began as a way of representing how we perceive the universe. So it has a mystical and a spiritual motive. And as society is evolved, it acquired a decorative value, which marked the beginning of the design, as well as an aesthetic value, which was combined with the religious. This is where the architectural and sculptural sense of this discipline is born, which derived in elaborate constructions or representations. We humans like lists. We love making lists of things not to forget, things to do, movie source, 
series you watch on Netflix. And in the case of R, the same thing happens. So I want to introduce you the Victoria genre. They are some kind of a taxonomy, a ranking since the very beginning of art development. They distinguish on every picture between its formal content and the uh, history of the story. They are meant they are meaning, they want to express. For example, this Palma in Vecchio painting, well, we all agree it's a woman, this is a portrait. Yeah, this is a portrait. But this is a second genre, the new or the name, which has given rise to rivers of ink. It's a naked woman or an undressed one. It depends. In art history, it has aroused a lot of controversy. But what happens if we focus our attention on the background, on the up on the upper right corner? It's a landscape, isn't it? And if we look at the whole painting, we can see a mixture of genre, portrait, perhaps mythological theme, landscape, new. Leo Battista Alberti once said, Amplicinum victoris opus non colossus set historia. Major enim est in geni laus in historia quam colossus, which more or less means, what is really important in our work is the content, the message, the narrative. And it was pointed out by now, this Italian Renaissance humanistic author, artist, architect, poet, well, he placed in the center of gravity in the content in the story, in the story, in the narrative that teach, that each painting can teach us. For example, this Jacques Louis David painting called The Rape of the Sudden Women was an incident in Roman mythology in which the men of Rome committed a mass abduction of young women from the other cities in the region. It's been a frequent subject of artists and sculptors, particularly during the Renaissance and post Renaissance eras. The historic genre is at the top of the hierarchy, busy showing great scenes of religious or moral content. It was based on literary, religious, or historical mythological texts. It includes representations of real or legendary events performed by divinities, heroes, or relevant people. It has a didactic moralizing objective to teach the spectator what she or she should aspire to, paralyzing with literature, tragedy, epic, poetry, etc. Well, until now we have watched the portrait genre, the nude, the landscape, the historical genre, and now we are facing a still life. The still life, as a genre, has its origin in the descriptive Nordic gates. The main genres gradually gave way to texture, shades, colors, etc. People were thus relegated to mere complement, often even omitted. The importance of the still life in the avant-garde battle falls with Finko's myth, the eclipse of the human in the painting certified the decline of the classical tradition in art, which defended that the only thing worthy of being represented, of being painted, is human action, man. As it has been stated, there is a inner tension between the objective and subjective dimension of each genre, of every genre. And I want to keep focusing, to dive in a little bit more on the portrait one. Uh, in this way, a hierarchy of values was established in the painting that prevailed the way, that, sorry, that prevailed the what over the how, the meaning over the signifier, and that, as Calvo points out, was constituted in the base of the classicism that, with diverse attacks and hesitations, has remained in force in our culture and the eruption of the avant-garde. The portrait can be seen as a journey, a journey through life, 
painting, what is seen, painting, what is told. A portrait can also be seen as a story. How so many times the story becomes a tale and some stories go down into history. A portrait collaborates in both processes. This Narcissus painting done by Caravaggio show us a great example of a self-portrait. Now it's time for us to take a chance and look Rembrandt's series of self portrait. Rembrandt, Rembrandt faced it as a portrait, a portrait maker, a genre in which the most important Dutch 17th century painter also reached the highest level. He was such a prolific painter and it's possible nowadays for us to trace his life back from the self-portrait he made. From since he was an adolescent, also as a, a young adult, as a mature person too, he even shows us himself as an old man in the middle of his innocence. He kind of mixes historical genre with still life. Portraiture is a multiform genre. Rembrandt takes this genre and reaches it to the sky. And also, with the 19th century and the emergence of photography, the scenario completely changes. In fact, it could be said that the artistic panorama was no longer the same. Do you want a fast portrait? Do you want speed? Photography is faster. Do you want a better price? Photography is cheaper. Was photography conceived for something more than the portrait? One of the characteristics of the photograph or the photographic portrait is its permeability. The creation of archetypes in the photography portrait allows many kinds of artists to give up their brushes and take on the frames, the cameras. Due to, not, due to the not so defined technique, the general composition of the sheen counted more than the singular expressiveness of the faces. The photograph on the left, resembling the one, the picture, on the right side, was made by Margaret Cameron, a pictorialist photographer. Photographers adopted ways of doing things that were typical of painting. This is as true as Cameron herself was more appreciated by painters than photographers. And with the apparition of photography, something that was already used in antiquity was in the scenario game, the support for the enormous sculptures. In the beginnings, the exposure time was very high, even of hours. Little by little, with the technical innovation, this was diminishing. Until then, well, if the classical sculptures like the two of Heracles and Aphrodite are supported by a stone, hide this disguise as clothing, photographers copied the same idea. They copied posture from the classical tradition and supported their models on chairs, seat backs, etc. So we're at a certain point when art reached its limit in when it reached its limits in religious motives, it turns its gaze toward the human being, exalting its beauty and ideals. Art and life began to conjugate, so it begins to portray important moments and people as well as everyday scenes. When the artistic motives used up to that moment became repetitive, art demonstrated its greatest function to incite the imagination. Just in the 19th century, with the Romanticism, where permission was given to capture the, the images that are born in our minds and with them create compositions that invited to move to other places. Finally, with the arrival of the avant-garde and postmodernism, art, art exhibited another, another of its great virtues, the ability to criticize itself. 
somehow it brings this idea brings bring us to, to, the, to the next point how photography and painting and the relation between them allows the new Portuguese to understand that they have to accept that a camera did not corrupt art. Both photographers and painters refer to the same topics like architectural points of view, landscapes, nudes, naked. During a brief analysis to this book, to this picture, to this painting representing Queen Elizabeth II from Spain. Not always photography copied art. In fact, in the specific case of portraits, many artists used this new invention for the pictorial works. The photographers also adopted certain pictorial codes when framing their shots, something that can be seen both in the scenography and the treatment of the strong points of that snapshot. As we have seen before, uh, in the, for example, in the new graph, in the new or in the landscape, but let's let's focus on the new. In the new, it looks very good. Many of the new photographs follow the classic canon of how they are painted, with some curtains and a very pictorial scenography. So to sum up, if I wanted you to, to take two ideas from my dissertation, well, I will highlight these two these two ideas. First of all. The importance of the image in representing the world around us from the very beginning of our history till right now. And the second one, well, how by applying a common language to a portraiture, photography and painting influence each other to the point of making portraiture the quintessential 19th century painting genre. I think it's over. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that now you will face the portrait in a perhaps a little different way. I leave my mail for any doubt or suggestions you want to make. And from now on, I thank you. Bye.